this. So uh, the, the upshot was that you know, before we made this change, we were utilizing 2% of the bandwidth of the disk, and we got all the way up to 4% um, with the market and you know, what we had before. Uh, nevertheless, it left some room for optimization. If you ever decide to take on a project, look for something where you have like this much to work with because you know you can make something run 10 times faster and you still only have to get up to 50%. <laughs> so, uh, the other thing was to improve the reliability. Uh, in those days, we didn't have FSCK. Uh, we had three programs, I-check, N-check, and D-check, which were sort of the three passes of what today is FSCK. But you had to run each one individually, and all they did was give you information, and then you had a couple of stone tools, like uh, clear eye to smash things you didn't want it allocated anymore, and uh, then you just had to use explicit link and unlink to connect things back together there. Um, at any rate, uh, the, uh, it was really painful when the system would crash because you couldn't, it couldn't come back up automatically. Well, in those days, it couldn't because it didn't understand doing that. Uh, but uh, it meant that somebody, like the system administrator, Reed Bill, had to sit down and do I check, N check, and D check, and clean everything up before the system could come back up again. And although we worked a lot of hours, it didn't work 24 by 7. So he got really tired of doing this. And did the initial work to stage the modifications that would be using B write uh, to, to all the critical information so that the file system wouldn't just end up in a complete state of muck after every crash. And uh, also then wrote some shell scripts that sort of glued I check, N check, and D check together uh, to be sort of really the first crude form of FSCK. In fact, the shell script was called FSCK. Okay, well, this all, you know led to the belief that there was clearly more things that needed to be done. So in 1982, uh, Bill had made sufficient progress uh, and had convinced uh, the powers that be at the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency that it, it was actually a good idea to fund Berkeley uh, to, to uh, develop what was then the BSD system into you know, adding a few things to it, like networking and a vast file system and working memory system and so on. And uh, miraculously convinced Arthur that this was a good idea and that they should pay Berkeley to do it. And so he couldn't really do all of this himself. And so uh, he had got, he'd got to work on the, the network because he thought that was the most interesting fit. And he had some ideas for this vast file system thing. And it turned out through a sort of series of goof-ups on the part of my thesis advisor that I was suddenly out of having any money to support me through the summer. And uh, you know, I mean, well-meaning, and it was going to be there, but you know, not for another few months. And as a graduate student, of course, your bank balance is approximately zero at all times. And so you can't just go and live off your, your non-existent savings for three months. So I went and talked to Bill, and I said, so uh, Bill, um, you know our advisor. Um, sort of messed up on the grant proposal and it didn't get it in on time and so the money isn't going to start flowing until fall and I know you have the DARPA grant and perhaps you could just uh, you know put me on to the project for the summer you know, and I'll do you know some random thing for you because as we both know I'm going to be working on my thesis and he said yeah yeah no that's not a problem at all you know I, I had these ideas for this file system thing and maybe you could just sort of flesh those out a little bit and, and uh, uh, you know see you know write a little paper or something for me about it knowing full well what was going to happen because, you know, well, his, his ideas were a couple of header files. Uh, and so I took those header files and well, I wrote a little more code and I extracted the old file system out of the kernel so I could run it in user land and then started putting some of these changes in. And by golly, by the end of the summer, I had something that, at least in user land, um, looked like it was going to work pretty well. And he said, well, I had, you know, you know, the other money's come in, but you know, why don't you just try dropping it in the kernel? Wouldn't you like to see how it works? And uh, well, okay, you know how long can that take? So you drop it in the kernel. Uh, except there's this problem that the kernel's actually multi-threaded and user land wasn't in those days. So there's just a few race conditions you need to deal with, things called locks and things and such. Uh, and SPLs, you know, he just told me to come out, comment out all the SPLs when I had done the user land, because he said I didn't need them. He was right, I didn't need user land. <laughs> but, uh, so it ended up, well, it was getting on towards December by the time I actually had this thing up and working. And by golly, it worked pretty well. And uh, 
Then he, then, then he dropped the bombshell. He said, you know, this, this is a great file system. Wouldn't you really like to see it go into production? Yeah, of course I said, I'd love to see it go into production. Said, well, you know, before we can put it in production, there's just a few other little things that need to be done. Let's see, dump, restore, FRCK, done. <laughs> <laughs> 18 months later, I got the <laughs> So the fast file system is designed as a hybrid block <coughs> so you have large blocks and you can break those up into small fragments so you can store files efficiently there. Uh, the large files use the big ones and the little ones you can use as little as a single fragment. When we first deployed it, we wanted to get really good packing density onto the disk and so we used a 4K block size and 512 uh, fragment size. So in fact, small files can once again be stored in a single sector on the disk, you recall that we had the 1K file system uh, previously. So in fact, when we rolled to the new file system, we actually had a little more space, except that um, this file system really needed to keep a reserve of blocks. So we instituted min-free, and so we took that extra space that we got back, uh, because all disks were always full within Epsilon, uh, and so we, we got the space back by going to 412, 4K512, and then took it away again by using min-free. In fact, the original value of min-free was such that it would be exactly a wash. <laughs> okay, um, this file system is still in use today, as you well know, um, on even things like Solaris and Darwin. Um, unfortunately, it hasn't changed since the mid-80s in the case of Solaris, but um, as you'll see, there have been a few other improvements made in the meantime. So by 19, um, actually it was 81 was when the I first had it sort of working. And then by 82, um, I had convinced uh, several of my office mates to put their home directories on. Um, as it turned out, that was a little premature. We lost a few files at one point, but um, <laughs> they were understanding. They were not quite so understanding when they realized that I wasn't keeping my home directory on there. But I had the sources and stuff that I needed to rebuild the bits and pieces to get their stuff back. So, um, I mean, I had dumped. I had dump written at that point. Now, I had dump tapes of it. The problem was there's a little rounding error. So if you, since dump had 1K blocks, if there was something that had an odd number of fragments, uh, then that last fragment got lost. So I had most of most of their files. <laughs> Unfortunately, most of the directories were one fragment, so I didn't have the names of their files. <laughs> So anyway, uh, the original file system, one of the ways it got its speed up was because in those days the disks told you complete information about the geometry. In fact, a disk driver, uh, when you wanted to read something, was a two-step process. You first did a seek to seek to the, and you gave the cylinder number that you wanted to get to. And the head would go to that cylinder, and then you'd get another interrupt saying, okay, I'm on the cylinder you want, and then you'd tell it, all right, which actual head do you want me to switch to? and at what rotational position from that head. In fact, there was even a rotational register, uh, or rotational positioning register, which would tell you what the rotational position was uh, of the disk. So that you could do this pretty cool stuff with scheduling where to put blocks and so on, so you didn't have to wait very long for the rotations. Um, at any rate, it didn't take very long before disks had gotten to the point where the disk manufacturers uh, they didn't improve the interface, so you didn't have to do this seek to, to cylinder and then rotational stuff. Uh, they just, you just hand them the, the block number on the disk that you wanted, which of course is the way it still is today. And uh, the problem with this was then, they still would sort of tell you what the geometry was, but it, they just sort of lied to you. You know, they just made it all multiply out to be the right number of blocks, but that was about all. And so it was all this stuff in there for calculating geometries, except that you were calculating on fictitious uh, physics, and so uh, worse than you thought, you, you calculate what you thought was the optimal block, and it turned out that it really wasn't. So that was actually a lot of code that was in the, the original um, system. I mean, the, the original fast file system was 1,200 lines of code, and this rotational stuff was probably about 300 of those lines. So we were able to get rid of you know, a quarter of the implementation by getting rid of that, getting rid of that stuff. Um, at any rate, uh, since they were by, uh, we just chucked all that code out. Um, you still see cylinder groups described today, and of course a cylinder group originally was a group of cylinders. 
Um, today we use the same terminology, but it's just really to collect a set of blocks together. Uh, and because we still want to do stuff where we localize things, and it's convenient to have those data structures to do that. Um, in particular, things like the bitmaps that tell you what's free and uh, what's in use and so on. Um, rather than just having one giant one, um, we have them sort of spread out through the disk so you can just go on location and pick up the local information that you need instead of having to keep it all in memory or some other complex data structure. Okay, so time passes and uh, the next thing that comes along in 87 is file system stacking. And this actually comes out of some work done by a guy named John Heidemann at the University of California at Los Angeles, you know, the other end of the state from us. Um, it was actually based on some work that was done by a guy named David Rosenthal. Um, and he had written this sort of theoretical paper on how you could stack file systems. And John Heidemann said, well, that looks interesting. I wonder if we can really make that happen. And so John did a, a prototype sort of implementation of this at UCLA and um, had given a paper about, I guess, at uh, Usenix probably. And I heard that and I said, oh, that sounds really cool. And you know, so you go up and you say, well, you know, is this something that I can get to put into the system? And the usual thing is when it's a research project, it's like, well, <laughs> I don't really think you want to do that. Um, at least my current implementation is a little work. A little work of me, it's like it has to be rewritten from scratch. <laughs> um, but uh, I said, oh, well, in that case, uh, you know, maybe you could come up to Berkeley and, and, and you know, spend a, you know, a couple of weeks and we could work together on getting it something integrated. Uh, and, uh, well, a couple of weeks turned out to be his entire summer. Um, and, uh, but by the time it was done, we actually had it in there. Uh, it uh, uh, essentially took what was the VFS interface <coughs> and generalized it, again, pretty much to the way you see it today, where uh, things like the VOP operators, uh, which used to just be a, a direct map into a function pointer, uh, have the ability to be uh, essentially layered one on top of the other, so that you can get a V node, and then you can go down, and you can use the operation for the next V node below it, and so on. Um, I'm going to have a couple slides on how this actually works. Um, one of the other things was, since we didn't have the static offsets, uh, the, you could just add VOP operators, uh, and you didn't have to go through and do it for every other file system. Uh, you could just put it in on the file systems that you wanted to have, understand it. And the rest, uh, if it didn't support the operation, would just pass it down to the next lower layer of the stack. And at the bottom of the stack was the enode uh, operation not supported uh, file system that could just return an error saying, I can't do that. So if you wanted to you know, add a transaction or something, you could just create, you know, start an end transaction, add some system calls that would like to get access to that. And then file systems that want to implement it could just do so, and the ones that didn't want to could just ignore it entirely. Uh, okay, so uh, the sorts of you know, things that got written from that then uh, was things like the UMAP file system that lets you remap UIDs and GIDs and UNFS export stuff and the local loopback file system and so on. Uh, well, it turned out that this guy named John Simon Pendry that, that was at uh, University College of London or King's College of London, one of the ones in London, um, saw this stuff and said, oh, this is really cool. I want to just try it out. And so he is the one that actually did the original implementations of the UMAP file system and the uh, the UMAP file system and a bunch of the other that are um, still in use today. Okay, just a sort of picture here to see how the stacking stuff works. At the bottom, we put the operation not supported file system. Uh, it's a very trivial one to write. It just catches all operations and says, I can't do it. Um, you can then put something like uh, UFS uh, on top of that. And then you can stack the NFS server on top of UFS uh, in order to export things. And uh, you can then make two mount points for that, one which is just directly uh, using the local UIDs and GIDs. Uh, and then you can add the, the UMAP file system over here, um, also mounted on here, but showing up in a different place. And then this is the one that you export to the outside world. And what will happen with this layer is all it really wants to do is to change UIDs and GIDs. So any VOP operation that doesn't involve a UID or a GID just gets passed straight through. And anything that has a, a UID or GID in it, you look at what it came in as, you have your little table that tells you how that maps to the local machine, and then you 
just make that flip and pass it down here. And then as it comes back, you do the reverse mapping uh, as it goes back out. And so in this way, uh, the, the local folks don't pay any extra cost. You haven't got it gummed up in your NFS server, uh, which is bad enough already. And uh, but the remote people, you can have you know, several of these if you have different mappings for different things that you're exporting. So uh, it, you essentially only pay the cost that you need. So this whole idea seems to work pretty well. As I said, uh, several other things got written. Uh, the loopback mount, uh, also known as nullfs, because it's, it's the null layer. Uh, it does no transformations whatsoever. The only purpose of it is to allow you to take one part of your file system and mount it somewhere else. Uh, so the code was written really just as sort of a prototype for how to write one of these things. If you ever want to write a layer, just go get the loopback, or the, the, it's called nullfs, and just take that, and then you can just add any, add any operations that you want to. So you want to write your own UMAP, you just go and find all the operations that you need to catch, write your little look aside table for the, the remappings, and just put it in there. Okay, so it's the, the, the loopback is implemented as this sort of null layer. You just take the original file system, you mount this layer on top of it, and then you just put that over someplace else where you want it to appear. And anytime you do a lookup through there, of course, all it really does is redirect you over to the location that you're looking back from, and then the, the real file system does all the rest of the work. Okay, so union mounts, uh, this was sort of one of the first more interesting uses of it, um, is really just a namespace translation. So the union file system doesn't store anything, because it's sort of a misnomer, because you think of file systems as being charged of storing things. But in the case of union mounts, it's really just coming up with a different way of doing the naming. So the idea is to allow multiple mounted file systems to be simultaneously accessible. So normally when you mount, whatever it's underneath disappears and the new thing's on top, union file system just gives you the sum of both of those. Uh, now, for cache coherency reasons, uh, you really don't want things being modified at lower layers. Uh, so you have normally have them read only, and then you put only the top layer um, as being writable. And uh, so the way it works is that uh, when you first create your union file system, uh, it just has a single directory, which is the one that's gotten mounted. Now as you start CDing down through the tree, uh, it creates the corresponding directories in the top layer. So that you'll always have a place if you need to create new files, or copy files uh, from the lower level layer, you'll have the ability to copy them up. So if you do a find from slash after you do a union mount, you can still do an exact set of directories corresponding to the thing that's underneath it. Okay, so uh, the naming, as I said, it shows the sum of all the files. Uh, if the same name appears in multiple layers, the, the one that you actually get is the one that's in the top layer. And if you create any new files, they get created in the topmost layer. If you try and overwrite a file that's at a lower layer, what actually happens is it gets copied to the top layer, which of course then makes the one underneath invisible to you, and uh, then the modifications all occur at the very top layer. Um, a typical use for this is you have a CD-ROM that you'd like to be able to make changes to, so you, you can mount a magnetic disk, a, a writable disk on top of it, and now as you go through and you change things, uh, the Anything you change gets copied to the top layer. If you don't change, you just continue reading off the CD-ROM. And the way these mounts work is that, that when you uh, do an unmount, it unmounts whatever the top layer is in the stack. OK, so just to get sort of an example here, uh, here we have uh, a bunch of things stacked up. Uh, so here we have in the topmost layer uh, the, the, in this uh, directory here, uh, VW and X, mounted on top of this one, which has X, Y, and Z. So this X is going to hide that X. So what you'll actually see is VW, X, Y, and Z from down below. So you do an LS, that's what you see. X comes from V. If you create a file T, that's going to get created in this top one here. You open Y for reading, it'll just read it from down here. But if you open it for writing, it'll first copy it up to here, and that's the one you get after that. And I've added another couple slides in here to just talk about how this thing all gets implemented, but I'm not going to go through that. 
today because we don't have long to do that. Okay, so by 1988, I guess. Uh, what is the difference between a union mount and the union file system? What is the difference between union mount and the union file system? They are the same thing. That's just the, the union file system is what gets mounted when you do a union because uh, um, for a long time the union FS previously was broken unreliable. Yes, it but is. but mount dash o union was still open, <coughs> but mount union FS was not. So well, that's crazy because mount minus o union mounted. Okay. The union file system. Oh, when you say mount minus O union, that just takes the program slash spin slash M O U N T underscore that name, and that's the file system. Yeah, I mean, minus O minus two. That's not true. Minus O, yes. Okay. Minus O is a union mount where you just have the visibility that the union has to the mount chain. Right, so you don't get all the semantics. Okay. Sorry, he's right. I'm getting O and T confused here. Okay. Um, I will say that Union Mount, as was pointed out, was broken for a very long time. <coughs> Finally, some very kind folks in Japan uh, wrote or rooted it and more or less rewrote it from scratch. And uh, today it works a lot better. So you can actually go back to using it again. Okay. Uh, so anyway, in 1988, we decided that the block size was getting big enough or that this was getting big enough that we really should have raised the block size so that we could essentially squander the, the extra 1.4% of the disk space uh, in order to get things to run faster. And uh, so we raised the, the vault block size 8K, 1K. You can still use 4K, 512 if you want to, but uh, if you don't otherwise specify, that's what you get. Um, so now small files use a minimum of two disk sectors. Uh, it nearly doubled the throughput again. Uh, again, just because you're doing less I.O., you have less indirect blocks, etc. So then in 1990, um, we started to getting the, doing these studies to see how well the file system did over time, uh, how well it was able to allocate things. And what we found was that over time that uh, the the free list, not the free list, but the free blocks tended to get sort of fragmented. So as you would create large files, it became harder and harder to find large chunks of contiguous space. And uh, the, uh, the, the goal was to try and you know, figure out some way of uh, changing the way allocation was done so that we could save the big chunks of, of uh, contiguous space for big files that they could use of it. The problem is, that the, the interface that we have doesn't tell us what the size of the file is going to be when you open it. Uh, if you had the <coughs> listening to the earlier talk with the IBM system, they had the benefit of when you would create a file, you would sort of say, what's the biggest it was ever likely to get? And so you had that nice hint. But we didn't get that. Unix doesn't give you that information. It just says, open a file. And it could be one fragment, or it could be one gigabyte. And you don't really know which it's going to be until it starts getting written. So if you always assume that it's going to be big, then and put it in a big available space, then pretty soon all you have left are small areas of contiguous space because most files, in fact, are small. So say, OK, well, we obviously don't want to do that. So let's assume it's always going to be small and put it in one of the little places that we have on the space. But then when the file suddenly starts to get really big, then the beginning of it, at least, is very poorly laid out. And it's right at the beginning when you're first starting up and you haven't got much read ahead going yet that you most notice uh, slow access. So the idea of dynamic block reallocation is to say, all right, well, we'll start out with the assumption that the file's going to be small, but then when we discover that in fact it's going to be big, we will pick it up and move it from where we, start, we put it in the small space and we will put it where there's the big contiguous space and then, of course, as it continues to grow, it will grow in that contiguous space, and it'll have a great allocation uh, from the get go. And so small files then always use small chunks of space. In fact, we always put them in the smallest chunk that we can find. So if it's two blocks, we find a little piece of two, three blocks, and put it there. And then it grows to three, three blocks, so we pick it up and move it to the place where we have three, three blocks. And then we find it's four, and we go to four, and five, and six, and so on. And you say, well, this sounds like it's going to be a lot of extra I.O. But 
Generally, it isn't because files tend to be written pretty quickly. And they're just sort of sitting in the buffer cache. And so when I say I move it from here to there, all I'm really doing is finding the buffer it's sitting in in the buffer cache and saying, I told you I wanted it to be placed on this sector. But I changed my mind. Instead, when you get around to writing it out, put it on this other sector instead. And so you just keep changing the, the destination address for it in its import buffer. And so by the time you finally get around to writing it, you've already made up your mind where its final resting place is going to be, and it is right at once. Now, if the file is really slow growing, like it's a log file, it starts out really tiny and over time and very slowly turns into a giant file, then in fact you really do end up reading it in and reading it back out to its new location. But if it's growing really slowly, then it doesn't really matter. The extra I.O. load uh, doesn't really affect you very much. So how effective is this? Well, it seemed like it was pretty effective. But it's one of those ones that's sort of hard to test because you know, most benchmarks, you create a new file system and then you test how well it works. And this is something that you're only going to find out after you've had the file system in use for a year or two or three. So we didn't really have a good way of characterizing it until these folks at Harvard, I was at a, a conference, and they were do, talking about some other thing they were doing. But in order to do their study, they had had to collect information about one of their main file servers. And the information they had collected was over a three-year period, they had recorded, essentially, uh, a, a timeline of every file that was created and how big it was and how long it lasted before then got deleted. And so they could age a file system basically replaying this and just you know, creating all the files in the correct order of the right size and deleting them at the right time and so on. And it took about one day to age it one year. So over not quite a three day period, they could age your file system by three years. Uh, and it was you know, realistic in the sense that it was what people had really done over that three year period. So I said, oh, that's really cool. Can you check and see how, this, you know, how well this works? Because it's an option, you can turn it on or off. And so they took the, the file system and ran it with dynamic block reallocation. And after it had been aged for three years, um, it was still within 15% of the performance that it had been when it was brand new. And when they turned it off, it was at about 40% uh, day grade. So it was on 14, 40% less good layouts as when it had been new. And in fact, if you look at the, the curve, um, it doesn't really take more than about a year to get down to that. What happens is the performance just drops off, drops off, and gets there, and goes sort of flat. Uh, whereas this one, it's just sort of a long, slow line, and after about two years, it sort of stabilizes at 15%. So it's a, something that's not that hard to do. I mean, in terms of implementation, it's a couple hundred lines of code at most. And you know, we presented this paper, and, and you know, I figured, oh, everyone's just going to pile in and add it to their file systems. And as far as I know, there's no other file systems out there today, even, um, that do this. So I don't understand why. Not for lack of me jumping up and down and saying that people ought to do it. <coughs> OK, so now more time passes. And uh, file systems continue to evolve along. And systems continue to get bigger and busier. And eventually, by the mid-90s, it's becoming clear that uh, performance issues with big files have been pretty much solved. But with little files, we still have a problem because the way that we make them reliable, the file systems reliable back in the late 70s was by adding all these synchronous writes. In particular, you do two synchronous writes for every file, create, or delete because you have to make sure things get done in the right order. And <coughs> synchronous writes, you can do about 40 to 60 of those per second which means that you can create somewhere between 20 and 30 files per second or at least 20 to 30 files per second. And so if you are trying to tar in something big or you're trying to run something like a mail spooler where it's creating and deleting these files all the time, the performance is not very good. So there was a big push in that time frame to try and figure out how to make file systems run faster, how we could get away from doing the synchronous writes. So, the, the, the key things that came up really was either journaling, logging, or in our case, soft updates. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk just sort of briefly, uh, do the comparison, if you will, um, of how these soft updates 
uh, work and compare that to journaling and blogging and so on. Okay, so you've got metadata that you have to maintain. The, the, the thing about file systems is uh, people will sort of tolerate losing data as long as it's you know not more than a you know, minute or two old after a crash, but they, they really don't look down or look well on curdling their file system. You know, blue screen adapt, you know, no problem, obviously. Uh, and uh, losing a little bit of data, well, you know, it happens. Um, and but curdle the file system where they have to go get, you know, restore from their non-existent dump tapes. You know, you don't get to do that very many times before they won't run your file system anymore. Uh, so uh, the trick to being able to recover a file system is that you got to keep the metadata in a consistent <coughs> enough form that you can always put it back in a, in a proper state after a crash uh, automatically. So the metadata is essentially the directories, the inodes, and the bitmaps that tell you like free and dirty unused blocks. And no matter what method you use, whether it's journaling or soft updates or synchronous rates or whatever, you got to follow these three rules. So you never point to something before it exists. Don't create a directory entry that points at nothing. Bad things will happen to you. Uh, never reuse a resource before you get rid of all the previous references to it. So uh, don't, like, when you're uh, freeing up a file, say, oh, well, we don't need these blocks anymore and put them on the free list. And then be casual and slow about zeroing out the inode on the disk. Because as soon as you put them on the free list, someone else can come along and use them. And you definitely do not want to end up with two different inodes on the disk that both claim the same block. Because FSCK has no idea whether it's a, if one of them thinks it's something.c and the other one thinks that it's a binary, uh, FSCK can't di differentiate which one should really own that block. Uh, if you're lucky, it's something that's obvious enough like that, and as an administrator, you can look at it and go, huh, yeah, that looks like uh, ASCII to me, so okay, it must be the .c file. Um, that gets old fast when there's like several thousand of them you have to do that way. <laughs> okay, so you want to make sure that you write out the zero inode before you put the blocks back on the free list. Because once you've written out the zero inode, then if someone else uses them and gets written out, you're not going to have two inodes on disk claiming one. The last one is pretty obvious. Never reset a <coughs> pointer to something that's live before you create the new one. Think rename here. Don't like delete the old name before you got the new one written because then you can end up with a file that has no name. I mean, it'll be found, put in lost and found with all 5,000 others, and you can point the user at it and say, well, it's in there somewhere. Go have a good line. <laughs> okay, so how can you do this? Uh, traditionally, that is in 1979, we did it with synchronous rights. Pretty easy. You just make sure that you do things one step at a time. So you want to create a new file, you allocate an inode, you'll be ready to disk. When the disk comes back and says, okay, it's on the disk, you have to make the directory entry, you have to be ready to the disk. When it comes back and says it's done, you say, cool, it's there. Similarly, when you're deleting, first you delete the name, then you delete the, the inode, then you put the blocks back on the playlist. Um, plods along, it's really easy, you know, it's step, step, step through the code. Uh, and so it's very easy to convince yourself that you got it right. The drawbacks is really slow if you've got to create the legal apps of files. And it's slow after a crash because we have to run this miserable FSK program uh, before we can bring the thing back up. So one of the very first ideas that came along was just put non-volatile RAM there. Because then you can just keep track in the non-volatile RAM of, of the operations that need to be done. Uh, and so now the system crashes, when you come back up, you just go through the RAM and say, well, what did I not finish before I crashed? And then you just go and do them. And so we figured that uh, you know, non volatile RAM was such an obvious thing to have that, of course, all machines would have it before long. And uh, as a chance would have it, they didn't. Uh, so we ended up getting a whole lot of code that worked with NVRAM, and then it didn't show up on all the workstations. And so we were sort of miffed about this. But uh, obviously, the manufacturers weren't listening to our clear needs. Uh, it turns out that non volatile RAM, uh, besides being expensive, is also kind of flaky. Uh, it has this battery that keeps it backed up, except that the batteries go dead. And there's usually a little light that's on the RAM. And it, it, it's one of the better user interfaces, not. 
Uh, the light is on if the battery is good, and the light is off when the battery is bad. Um, and so you're supposed to look in the back of your machine periodically and see that the light is not on. And then know that that means you need to replace your battery. And the battery lifetime is on the order of two to three years. And the lifetime of your disc is on the order of two and a half to three and a half years. And so the, the most common thing that seems to happen is the battery fails just shortly before the disc does. And so then it craps out and you don't have any non-volatile memory and so your whole thing is all. Yeah. Yeah. And to solve that problem, there are battery backup RAMs for disk controllers which stop working after 12 to 15 months, depending on what model you're buying. They just stop. The entire controller tells you there are no disks connected to it. So that's also <coughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it turns out non volatile RAM still does get used today. It's mostly for things like NFS servers and so on. But and and there, yeah. wasn't part of the lack of adoption that some patent thing? Sorry, Sun, Sun took out a patent on non volatile storage for file systems. Yeah. And didn't that more or less block it in the marketplace? Uh, because no, they, whenever they, I talk to vendors, say, you should really make a PTI account <coughs> with a battery back RAM for us. They say, hey, that's an obvious idea. And then they never come back. And they go, well, I'll always look at it. And there's this patent from Sun. You don't. Uh, Sun actually allowed it to be used, because a number of, of people do. Allowed, as in. Uh, it was a, you had to get a license, but there was no cost to get the license. Okay, that's not the story I've heard. Yeah, well, I mean, things like network compliance use it, for example. And network compliance is suing Sun, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think that if Sun had some leverage over them, they could do it. I mean, network compliance is a classic example where it's getting sort of back to the point that you made. When the battery goes bad, you get these increasing levels of uh, complaint on the console and mail sent to you and etc. And at some point, it just refuses to work until you fix the, you know, replace the battery. Actually, it just stops working. I spent three days on replacing cables and ramps and everything until I found some small print in the manual that the battery just times out, no matter whether it's working or not. Well, okay. You know, you wouldn't want your battery to die. <laughs> okay. The bottom line, though, is uh, Depending on NV RAM being there, it is, it's just not really a viable solution. Okay, so what other choices do we have? Um, atomic updates. Um, this is logging or journaling. The uh, difference between logging and journaling is that journaling is just tracking the metadata. Logging is tracking everything, all the writes as well as the metadata. So logging actually gives you better recovery uh, than we would get by any of these other techniques because they're really only dealing with the metadata. Well, actually, that's not true. NV RAM can deal with data as well, uh, but it's big enough. At any rate, um, the, the idea is that everything gets written twice, once to the log and then once to where it really goes, but the log is just a continuous stream of records, and so they just get written out in blocks, and so you don't, uh, you don't have the head CPU around. So although there are synchronous rates that are happening, um, they're all in one place, so they happen a lot quicker. Uh, any single operation run slowly, but if you've got a lot of them happening all at once, they all move along pretty quickly. Uh, so the drawback is you generate extra I.O. Uh, you don't get much speed up on late loads like you care, but uh, on under heavy loads, it, it works. Um, it gives you the speed up that you want. And uh, recovery is pretty quick, because all you have to do is a, a log or a journal rollback. So you just walk through there, just like with the MD RAM, fix everything they get done uh, before the crash. So the next idea that came along was a partial ordering of, of writing the buffers. The idea is to just keep track and say, well, this buffer's got inodes, and that's a directory, and uh, we're creating things so the inode has to be written before the directory. Uh, so anytime you want to write the directory, you just go make sure you write the inode block first. Uh, the problem is that create, delete, have the reverse dependencies. So create, you've got to write the directory for the inode first and then the directory. And remove, you've got to write the directory first and then the inodes. And so you get these circular dependencies where you can't write either one. Uh, and because things like mail schools are creating and deleting files at the same time, this doesn't work a lot of the time. So soft updates is really just partial ordering, except that finer granularity. Instead of keeping track of things at a buffer level, we keep track of things at an individual metadata level. and so we just make sure that if you decide you want to write this, uh, any directory entries that are being uh, created and pointed items that haven't been written yet, we sort of roll those back, write the ones that we can write, 
roll it forward and uh, carry on. So most of the operations run at memory speed, uh, and uh, we reduce the system I.O. We're not double writing stuff like we are with journaling. Uh, we have instant recovery after a crash, because although the, disk, the on disk is behind the in-core state, it's always behind in a consistent way. Uh, the drawbacks are it's complex code. Uh, at one time, there was only one person in the world who understood it. Luckily, uh, uh, I was not hit by a truck before four other people learned uh, how it worked. So even if I get hit by a truck, there's someone, other people that can carry on. In fact, I think they know it better than I do at this point. Um, the other problem is increased memory loading. Uh, you delete 50,000 files, you create 100,000 dependencies, all of which are in kernel memory. And so if you have very <coughs> intensive small file activity, uh, you can fill up your kernel quite a bit. One of the questions I get asked endlessly is, how does all updates compare with journaling? Uh, they were, again, that same group at Harvard that I talked about earlier uh, did a journal version of the fast file system uh, and compared that to soft updates. Uh, the executive summary is if you run certain little micro benchmarks, um, soft updates run circles around journaling if you have enough memory on the system, which is to say at least half a gigabyte. Uh, in real benchmarks that anyone cares about, they're pretty much a wash. They both do pretty much the same, they, you know, they, one or the other will win slightly on any of these things like postmark or so on. Okay, there's more in, that in the slides if you care about the details. Moving along though, because uh, time is somewhat of the essence here, uh, we have snapshots. Uh, this creates a copy on write image of the file system partition. Uh, so it's creating a copy on write of the disk image. So it's sort of below the level of the file system and we don't really have time to talk about the details of it, but again, there's all of the stuff in here if you really care. Uh, by 2001, we decided it was time to raise the block size again, this time up to making the default 16K blocks, 2K fragments. Uh, and now small files are using a minimum of, of four disk sectors, but with terabyte disks, you don't tend to really notice that much. Uh, it, again, it didn't really do the double throughput, but it, it helped with probably by another 50%, uh, and uh, we are now wasting an extra 3% on the disk space. Which out of the terabyte is not in significance? Yes? Um, you're increasing or raising the block size uh, every several years. Yes. But the, uh, the weight between the block size and the fragment size is still a factor of 8. Yes. Uh, we don't have 8 bits to use anymore. Would it be an ID to? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the question is whether we should allow that ratio to be bigger than 8 to 1. Uh, the current implementation is a table lookup, and that means it's 256 entries in the table. If we went to 16 to 1, it would be a 128 kilobyte table to do the lookups, uh, which, you know, an extra 128K on most systems you probably wouldn't notice these days, but, you know, the embedded people would probably get a little cranky with us. Um, we could also do it without using the table lookup, but then it would get slower. Um, so, for the most part, if, if this, if we go up, you know, kick this up again, um, the next number that this goes up by is on the order of five percent. So at that point, I may bite the bullet and actually go back and rethink the ratio. Okay. All right. So along by 2002. A lot of people had deployed soft updates. It, it was a long, slow uptake on soft updates because being complicated code, uh, it took a, a while to, to get some of the, the uh, I don't really want to call them bugs per se, but you know, you know, they hang your system, and I guess it's to that bug. Uh, so people weren't really willing to, to, to use them until they were fairly convinced that they were going to work. And, uh, so, but by 2000, 99 or 2000, a lot of people were starting to use it. The one fly in the ointment with, uh, with soft updates is that although you can reboot after a crash repeatedly, I mean, you can crash and reboot and crash and reboot and crash and reboot to your heart's content. I don't know how content you are by having lots of crash and reboots, but you can do it and you don't ever have to check your file system or do your own rollbacks or anything. You just carry on. But the problem is that you lose stuff. So you end up with blocks that the file system thinks are in use that actually are not in use. And you end up with inodes that you think are in use that are actually not in use. So you've got this sort of dark matter 
hiding out in your file system. And it just, it's like this black hole that's sucking space away. Um, so DF reports that you know, your file system is nearly full. And you're looking at it, and it doesn't look like it's nearly full. And the problem is that you've got all these things that you think are in use, but really aren't. And so at some point, you've got to reclaim that stuff. And the only way, historically, that you had of doing that was to unmount the file system and run out of SDK while you went out for a very long, leisurely lunch. And, uh, and you could come back and it still wouldn't be done. Um, at any rate, uh, people said, you know, this is, this is not workable. We've got to have some way of being able to reclaim this stuff um, without having to take the system down or offline. So background FSCK uh, came about. Well, it started out, I was trying to figure out how to do you know, real-time garbage collection. There's tons of papers on it. The more I read, the more complicated it looked, and the less I was interested in doing it. I mean, I'd written that in CK, that was bad enough. And I didn't really want to do the whole thing again. And then it struck me, I said, hey, we got these snapshots. And the snapshot is just like a frozen image of the disk. We, and that's what FSCK wants. So I'll just take a snapshot and then point FSCK and say, here, clean that up. And so then FSCK just grinds through in its usual leisurely fashion and until it finally figures out all the things that are free. Um, that aren't in the bitmaps. And then normally what it does is it just reads the bitmaps and jams them in and writes them back out. You obviously can't let that happen uh, because the file system is active. So you have to add a system call that lets you <coughs> go in and say, put these blocks back in the bitmap under a lock, release these inodes under a lock, and um, those things happen. So that's just a description of what I just said. Okay, other things you can do with snapshots, you can do live dumps, snapshot the file system, and then just you know, run dump on the snapshot so you can, don't, again, don't have to take the, the file system offline to get a consistent dump. Uh, the, one of the reasons for putting in snapshots is because everyone said, well, you know, our appliance has the ability to take snapshots. I, you know, what's with this UFS thing? You know? So, of course, I said, well, we, we can do that. We can just take midday backups just like our appliance does. You just snapshot it every few hours. Uh, and uh, then you can just, since it's just a disk image, or a read-only disk image, you just take that and uh, put it under a V node and then mount that V node someplace, and, you know, slash user slash backup or whatever. And then when the user comes and whines about some file that they've deleted at noon, you say, well, if it existed at 10 this morning, then just go over, and it's in your home directory where you left it, uh, over in backup. <coughs> and so they have to go down there. And you don't have to worry about them get the stuff they shouldn't get because all the regular file system permissions are enforced. So anything that they could read at 10 in the morning, they can still read. And stuff they couldn't read at 10 in the morning, they still can. So it lets users take care of their own problems, which is always a good thing for a system administrator. Uh, the one thing, of course, is that uh, network appliance has now moved along, so you don't have to go find it off in some backup directory area. Um, they have sort of, each directory has a, a sort of dot directory dot 10 a.m. and dot noon and so on, sitting right there in the directory, uh, and you just tell the user, oh, it's in you know, the dot 10 a.m. directory in the directory that you lost it out of, and then they can CD in there. Well, we don't quite have the ability to do that, but we now have, we have the union file system. So with a very small change to the union file system, we could just take the snapshot and union mount it right on top of, uh, or actually underneath <coughs> the, the real file system, and then you could just Create that. You'd have to do a little bit of fudging with the names, you know, change it to .10am or whatever. Uh, so that's that's a project that I'm always looking for someone to like do because you know I don't have any free time, but all of you with infinite free time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> one minute. One minute. One minute. No, come on now. I got five minutes. That's what you need to go out Ah, okay. I'm not going to hold questions then because I got just a couple more to do here. In 2003, we went to multi-terabyte support, that is UFS2. Um, we also added extended attributes, which are sort of like Apple file forks, where you can keep extra data about a file. And we then went on to use that in 2004 to do access control lists, which is using finer grain control over NFS files. Uh, we're not going to talk about how they get implemented. Uh, in 2005, the mandatory access controls came out. Uh, this is a whole framework that allows you to get much finer grain control over how things work in the system. Things sort of jail kind of uh, capabilities here. Uh, but you can also store some of these access controls 
um, in, the, in this metadata area. Finally, in 2006, symmetric multiprocessing, uh, the five-year project got finished. Uh, actually, it was 04 that the V node interface got done. 05 was the disk subsystem, uh, the CAM and, and ATA. And then finally, in 06, the, the file system to complete the, the path through the kernel. And that's it. Um, I have. 